Ave Maria. In the third chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, St. Luke, who wrote the Acts, tells us that Peter and John were going up to the temple. And at the beautiful gate, there was a man who had, was crippled from, from um, a child. He had never walked for some 40 years. And that he used to beg at the beautiful gate. Our Lord must have seen him. He must have walked past him on many occasions, but he was not healed by our Lord. Peter and John, however, going up, seeing him, and he looking at them, stopped and having nothing to, to give him, no arms. In fact, Peter said, still for the goal, we do not have, but what we do have, we will give you. And immediately he said, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man did exactly that. He jumped up. And not only jumped up, he danced. And he was making a great noise. And there were a crowd of people there who saw this. And it, 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 that also attracted an even greater number of people. And these people knew the man. They knew he'd been crippled, that he'd never walked. And here was he, not only standing, but actually walking and more, jumping. In fact, we're told he danced into the temple. So his crippled feet were strong as if he had never had a problem with them. Now begins the investigation because the authorities are going to send the, uh, uh, the guards to bring the, the, the man and the apostles into their presence where they are going to be interrogated. And what is interesting is that they cannot um, deny this miracle. But before we go there, what happens? Peter addresses the people, those who had gathered, those who had been witnesses to the miracle, and were also had also known the man to be crippled. How does he address them? Very similar to the way he addressed them at Pentecost, yet with slight variation. Because at Pentecost, the the, the people only heard the sound of the wind and the the rocking. They felt the rocking of the house, and they came trying to find out what was the matter, what had caused this commotion. And they were of the impression that the apostles were drunk with wine, although it's only nine in the morning. But there's no such um, circumstance here. It was just the plain miracle being worked, and there were witnesses to it. So St. Peter addresses them with much more mildness. First of all, he addresses them as Israelites. He acknowledges their common nationality, their common origin, and, of course, their family. It is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors. So he's taking them right back to the very foundation of the nation, or at least of the people, uh, the family. Abraham. Abraham who believed. Isaac who also believed. And Jacob whose belief was reinforced. In the case of Jacob, God had said repeatedly, I am with you. Jacob, of course, had doubts about this because, as you know, his name means he who struggles, and his whole life had been a struggle. He had struggled against his brother Esau, he had to contend with Laban, his uncle, he had to, to um, mediate, and he struggled against his two wives, he had problems with his own children, and lastly, he had problems with God. He struggled even with God. That tells us how our spiritual life should be. Because at the end of it, he still, he still has God as his God 
and his father. He is the God of our ancestors. What has this God of our ancestors done? St. Peter tells us. You are Israelites, and it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, who has glorified his servant Jesus. How is Jesus glorified? When just a few weeks before they saw him, these same Israelites, they saw him condemned as a criminal, subjected to a shameful death. And yet, St. Peter calls this glorified. He calls him the servant. He doesn't at this time call him the Son of God. But he's keeping his um, tone very mellow, very controlled, because he wants to win them over. He says he calls him the servant. And then he says what they did to the servant. The same Jesus you handed over. So they, the Israelites, the people, the leaders, handed Jesus over to a shameful death, but God has glorified him. That's the first contrast. The, he goes on. You handed him over and then disowned him in the presence of Pilate. So you have disowned him. We have no king except Caesar. After Pilate had decided to release him. And here we have another contrast because Pilate, a Gentile who is not an Israelite, who is not a recipient of the prophets, who only met Jesus once, who recognizes innocence, who knew it, he was there because of the envy of the authorities, wanted, determined to release him. But he says, you disowned him. Not this man, but Barabbas. It is you, St. Peter continues, who accused the Holy One, the Just One. You accused him. He's a malefactor. He's a blasphemer. And demanded the reprieve of a murderer. He preferred to have a murderer. And Pilate said, you have a custom that on the feast I release a prisoner to you. Whom do you wish me to release? Barabbas or Jesus? And he said, not this man, but Barabbas. Barabbas was a murderer, one who took life. Jesus was one who gave life, raising the dead. Barabbas, who was a robber. Jesus, who gave out of his wealth. Barabbas, who was not a servant of God. Jesus, whom St. Peter calls the servant of the God of our ancestors. And you killed the Prince of Life. This is the stark contrast that the Apostle is drawing. And indeed, it's enough to terrify those who hear. But the story didn't end with the death of Jesus, as St. Peter goes on to say. God, however, raised him from the dead. So God has glorified him by raising him from the dead. God did not glorify him by taking him down from the cross. For they had said, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. And they said, if God approves of him, let him take him down. So they had blasphemed him on the cross. But God did not take him down, nor did he descend. Rather, God did what was even greater. He raised him from the dead. And the, the apostle goes on. And to that fact, we are the witnesses. So he calls it a fact, a reality. And he brings in the whole college of apostles. We, all 10 of us, 11 of us, 12 of us, more of us, because it wasn't just the, these, um, the, the 12 who were witnesses to the resurrection. We have the two going down to Emmaus. We have the women and so on. 
So there were many witnesses who could testify to the fact, because we only testify to facts, that God raised him from the dead. Now this would have terrified the people hearing what they had done. And so the apostle gives, exculpates them. Now I know brothers, he calls them brothers, so to show that there is no animosity. I know, brothers, that neither you nor your leaders had any idea what you were really doing. If they had no idea, it meant they were acting in ignorance. And if they were acting in ignorance, then their sin, still real, was not so great. But yet, it was great because their ignorance was culpable. They could have known who Jesus was because of the miracles. If you don't believe me, at least believe what I do for the sake of the miracles, is what our Lord had said. But they denied even the miracles. They wanted to kill Lazarus because our Lord had raised Lazarus and, the, uh, and the, the ordinary people were believing in Jesus because of Lazarus's resurrection. So they acted in ignorance in as much as they did not know who they were killing, but nonetheless, they deliberately did so when they had the, it was within their, their um, grasp of, of, of knowing who they were killing. But St. Peter, for the moment, wishes to pacify them, to placate them, to win them over. And so he pleads ignorance for them, even as our Lord pleaded ignorance. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. This, St. Peter says, was the way God carried out what he had foretold when he said through all his prophets his Christ would suffer. So they were, in fact, fulfilling the prophecies. It is not that God had determined that this was the way that um, salvation would be brought about, but rather God had determined salvation would come about and he knew how the Jews, the Israelites, would behave, and therefore he incorporated their behavior, their malice, into his plan. It is not that God determined evil, or God wanted evil, but rather God allowed evil so that he could bring the good out of it. So this was the way God carried out what he had foretold when he said through all his prophets, not some, but all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer. And so, you are in fact instruments, is what St. Peter is saying, in God's plan. So what are they to do? He tells them, now you must repent. So the first thing is repentance. And turn to God. That's the second thing. So repentance means that one judges oneself as guilty and condemned, and then turn to God for mercy. And what will happen? So that your sins may be wiped out. And notice what the apostle is saying. He's going to the very reason for Christ's suffering. He did say so that your sin, in the singular, may be wiped out. But beyond that, all your sins might be wiped out, which is the very reason that Christ came. It wasn't just for the sin of the, of the crucifixion of the deicide, but rather all the sins that are a consequence of what we have inherited from Adam. And so the apostle is going to win over another crowd of believers who recognizing the evil that they have been involved in, the sin that they committed, will indeed repent and will turn again to God and, believing in Christ, have their sins forgiven. The tragedy is, of course, that whilst these people to whom St. Peter initially speaks, while they hear and they believe, when they arrive in the presence of the authorities, their 
hardness of heart will again manifest itself and the authorities will reject the, with the testimony of the apostles. Whilst they will not be able to deny the fact, the reality of the miracle, they'll say that much, we cannot deny the miracle. They will nonetheless try to silence the apostles and command them not to speak in that name again. But Peter himself will answer, and this is the, the answer we also must give. To whom shall we obey, God or man? It is not possible for us to keep silent, to keep quiet about what God has done, that he has raised his servant, his son, from the dead, and that there is no other name by which we can be saved. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Santa Maria.